Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a beautiful brand new day. And welcome to Dear Ms. T with Terry Ruel, life coach, retired psychotherapist, and all around wise woman. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Dana. Good morning, everyone out there in Radio Land. Happy New Year. Uh, we are starting off on a, a new year, so I kind of got inspired to maybe try to do something on, you know, not so much a New Year's resolution, but just it, it, I thought, you know, we can start anew every day. And sometimes the New Year is just kind of a, a nice little reminder and motivator that we can start anew. And um, I've been kind of starting working on a whole decade, um, not just the past year. So that's been a, um, taking a lot of time and energy. But when I turned 70, I realized that there had been so many things in my 60s um, of change and loss one right after another that it was going to take some serious time to really start um, really processing and healing and releasing all of that. And that's one of the things that I thought of about today with um, how do we transform old uh coping strategies that really might have helped us survive growing up but get in our way now on our healing journey and and be able to not only recognize them but transform them into real coping skills that we can use to help our healing continue and you know being a holistic practitioner I really like to look at things that how it affects us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And we know that whatever dysfunctions or traumas we grew up with, um, and we all had some, and, and depending on the severity of it, our bodies are going to react um, either um, in a way to protect us or a way to try to find safety so we know the nervous system will always react to uh, anything that we experience as we need to protect ourselves or we need to find safety and like you say depending on how much trauma we had and how severe those reactions in our systems physically um, will be maybe take a little longer to heal and process and release and maybe patterns that come back um, you know every time something overwhelms us for a long time um, but eventually they may come back but so mildly that they're not traumatic and we recognize them right away and we can take care of ourselves. So what are we talking about physically? Well, we're talking about the fight, flight, freeze or fawn reactions in our nervous system. And a lot of times it, it can be helpful to look at what are the uh, emotions that we're experiencing that trigger that flight fight, freeze, or fawn reaction in our systems, and how can I help transform that into a, a coping skill and not just a, a reaction that may be getting in my way? And some of these are obvious. Some of them are not so obvious, so I thought we could go through them a little bit. The flight response usually manifests in our adulthood as workaholism, overthinker, um, people with high anxiety or panic or uh, OCD, um, difficulty sitting still, ADD, ADHD, hyperactivity um, kind of symptoms, the perfectionist, and it can even be chronic sadness um, and depression. Um, the fight response 
Um, that has some obvious things in it, too. The fight response usually manifests as anger outbursts, a great need to control. Um, the bully or the narcissist is, is often a fight res uh, response. And remember, all these responses are a reaction from our nervous system getting um, shot full of adrenaline and cortisol and us feeling overwhelmed and in danger. And so then we want to protect ourselves or create safety. And so it's that flight, fight, freeze, or fawn. Another fight one is, you know, explosive behavior, backing people off by just blowing up and scaring them with our anger. Um, irritability, you know, uh, being irritable a lot can keep people away, make you feel like you've got some kind of barrier around you. Judgment, of course, can, can keep people away. Um, some physical signs would be like slamming doors a lot. Okay. Um, the freeze response. Okay. And this is probably was my biggest one. Um, and so, like I say, the thing that's really helpful about knowing this stuff is that you can recognize it then a lot easier and faster when it starts seeping in again, you can go, oh, I am falling into my um, old coping strategy to try to protect myself. So that gives you a lot of information. I'm feeling overwhelmed about something, and I'm falling into an old pattern. So what do I need to do to take care of myself and transform this old pattern into a, something that's really going to help me now? And so the freeze response is if you're having a lot of difficulty making decisions or being very indecisive or feeling stuck for a long time. You know, we all feel stuck for periods of time in our life and sometimes for real reasons. If we're in between wanting to try to change jobs or whatever, but feeling stuck in life more generally, um, disassociating, you know, just being able to numb out and shut down and to the point where you can, you're not in your body, you're just not um, present to yourself or to life. Um, isolating, you know, this was a hard one with COVID when for people who have freeze trauma response and had to isolate a lot, it's I think it makes it difficult when you come out of that to get yourself back out there and to maybe even recognize again that uh, maybe there's a lot of stuff going on that you didn't realize or a lot of grief there, work there, um, that you didn't realize you were isolating from that also because you had to isolate in quarantine. Um, so it's, you know, like numbing out and shutting down. Um, it can be exhaustion. Freeze can be, you know, that chronic exhaustion. And it can be procrastination. Uh, procrastination can be a flight or a freeze response. Um, so if I'm procrastinating on something, that's a, a, you know, information. That's a clue my body's giving me, it's telling you, okay, I'm feeling overwhelmed about this, or I'm feeling anxious about this, and so I'm trying to kind of numb out, or I'm trying, the anxiety about facing this, or feeling this, or doing this project, or having to be in front of people, whatever it is, is causing me anxiety, and so my tendency is to want to procrastinate, flight, or freeze, but what that's going to do is just increase your anxiety, right? So we know with procrastination that, yes, we have to give our body time to um, calm and to recognize and breathe through those feelings and acknowledge them, honor them, give them their moment, but then we know, okay, if I start to just plan 
and actually take some action on what I'm procrastinating on, that's what's really going to bring my anxiety down. So the last one would be the fawn response. Um, so if, you know, with the people pleasing, this is the real kind of codependency stuff. I'm feeling overwhelmed, so I try harder to people please everybody um, or have no boundaries. And I don't know who I am without taking care of everybody else. And so my lack of identity it is causing me to feel like I have to be in this role to have some kind of identity. And codependency can be... You know, it sneaks back in all the time, and it can be triggered. All of these fight, flight, freeze, or fawn things are triggered by um, feelings of being overwhelmed, and that, you know, can come from anywhere and anything, and depending on how far we are, like I say in our healing journey, it depends on how severe it's going to feel and how much time you're going to need to take for yourself like for instance I know turning 70 and wanting to work through what I would I think of as all the icebergs that got stuck in my system during the decade of my 60s because of chronic loss and change every year something major that it was going to take a lot of time and maybe who knows how much but I had to give uh, myself so much time for each year to just start really allowing myself to be in those memories and those feelings and breathing through them so that my body could start melting those icebergs, okay, because they were stuck in there. And that's a lot what happens is you get older sometimes, too, because you can have a lot of losses right in a row. We start losing family members and friends and, and you know, health problems that feel like a major loss or changing, having to move, give up our family home I mean all kinds of things can happen so you really have to give yourself time for each thing for your body to be able to and the nervous system to be able to come back to balance and so that's why it's so important at first we have to acknowledge we have to be able to recognize that something is happening in my body that um, I'm overwhelmed emotionally and maybe mentally, you know, because of too much information. Sometimes we get overwhelmed because we, we have so much information to process now. Um, spiritually, I might feel overwhelmed just because there's a lot of stuff coming in. Um, so being able to recognize that that's happening and know, okay, my system is going into overdrive and my nervous system is going to want to fight flight freeze or fawn with and you start to be able to recognize what are your patterns um, which ones really start to get triggered for you the most and you can then say okay I'm gonna allow myself to feel these feelings and feel this in my nervous system and just keep breathing through it and letting it start, start to melt, start to release. It's kind of like grief work, you know? It's like we have to allow ourselves to let it come up, whatever it is, so that it can be honored and have its moment, and then it will release. It will start to melt, and the adrenaline comes down, and the cortisol comes down, and then we can start to feel like, okay, who, you know, what can I do now to try to help myself recognize when that emotion or that behavior is coming up and give myself the time I need, but then 
what could I do to actually start changing that reaction into a positive coping skill? So you, you want to, to, you know, like with procrastination, you know that eventually doing some action is going to help you to feel better and help to release that overwhelm. But you don't want to just try to jump to that. It's not about putting more pressure on yourself because that's just going to feed the adrenaline, the cortisol. That's just going to feed your feeling, your sense of danger or not being safe or needing to protect yourself. You know, that's why you always hear therapists who are always saying, no shooting on yourself, you know. Anything we do that puts more pressure on us is just going to trigger our body to want to feel safe, and then it's going to trigger us to want to do one of these fight, flight, freeze, or fawn behaviors, or we're going to have those overwhelming feelings. So, the, you know, just picking one thing this year of, okay, I'm just going to work on letting myself recognize when something is coming up and just letting myself acknowledge it and breathe with it. Mm-hmm. And not even, you know, you don't even have to try to that is a way to actually transform that to a skill Mm -hmm. being able to breathe through our our feelings of fear are huge ways to turn um yeah old things into new positive coping skills you know it's like awareness acceptance and then the action can just be allowing it to be there and breathing through it because what you're doing is actually retraining to your nervous system that okay i there's no danger i can keep myself safe i it's okay i'm protected Mm -hmm. you know it's one of the ways i've i think i read something about somebody saying you know it's like you learn to set boundaries but you don't have to be an electric fence where people are going to get shocked if they get near you because <laughs> that's actually going to make you feel like you're not really safe on top of them not feeling safe. You know, it's, it's being able to breathe through and get into that melted space enough that you can feel protected because you're surrounded by the Christ light or you're surrounded by the blue light of the angelic realm or, you know, knowing that you're not alone and there is a higher um, self there that is protecting you. And sometimes that comes from doing your inner child work too, because you become, you reparent your inner child Mm -hmm. And it's usually your inner child that is carrying the fear that and the trauma. Um, not always. I mean, some of our traumas come in adulthood too. But if you know that these, that those um, fight, flight, fear, freeze, or fawn reactions or feelings are coming from the fear of things that happened to you as a child, then you can also, while you're breathing through it, be telling your inner child, it's okay. We're safe now. We Terry, know how to take care of ourselves. Um, Del, Del Marie is in the chat room and she wants you to know, uh, she's saying, great topic, Terry. Um, great topic to listen to with my situation, knowing my emotions. I just wanted to let you know that uh, your fans Thanks. are enjoying your show today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and like I say, I, I'm working on this stuff too. Um, the challenge, you know, like say sometimes as you get older is um, you don't just, you know, have a New Year's resolution. You re- realize, oh, it's a decade now. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and that kind of can be a little overwhelming Terry, when when I'm 
when I'm listening to you, I have, I have a question. Um, I'm listening to everything that you're saying because I'm one of your biggest fans, as you know. Oh, thank um, you. When I'm listening to what you're describing, the fawning or the flight, the fight, don't you see or do you see um, this also play out in social media, the way people respond to things or the things that people post? Or if you're the person on the other side of the screen sitting at home, the, the feeling, the compulsion to have to respond quickly and be part of everything. How does social media play into this? Well, I think it has really um, kind of inflicted more of this um, um, dysfunctional pattern on us because it's so um, reactive often. And whenever we're just reacting, we're probably going into a fight, flight, or freeze, or fawn mode. You know, we don't always see the 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 freeze one on social media because people just disassociate or numb out and and don't respond but that energy still goes into their body you know it, it's still causing them pain so you know I, I mean I'm sure there are positive things with social media I know that especially with seniors a lot of times it's kept people feeling connected which is a wonderful thing especially you know during COVID and stuff But I think if we're not very aware of how easy it is to be reactive out of our own stuff and other people reacting out of their own stuff, we're going to feed each other's old coping patterns that, you know, were, they were there to help us when we were kids, but they don't help as we become adults you know, and they don't help our inner child heal because we're just reinforcing that child's fear that they have to keep doing that. So, you know, anytime, you know, we talk about this a lot with codependency. Breaking codependency is about not reacting. You know, you never react. You wait, you breathe, you, you center, you see you know, what your choices are and choose if you want to even respond or not. Because almost all the time, like you say, unless we're, you know, maybe a guru or something, you know, our reactions are not going to always come from a a place of, of real health and healing. Our responses, though, can come from that and a maturity and a love if we took the time to make sure none of our stuff is connected to it, that, you know, none of our um, wounds are connected to it, that we're responding out of what we've learned has been healthy for us. And it's always talking from the I, you know, I can only say, this is what I've learned. This is what I've experienced. This is what's worked for me. It's not, ever healthy to um be saying you 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 know telling other people how they should feel or what they should think or how they should do if people are caught up in a lot of the their trauma and they're coming from their trauma you know that there's you that's not going to change them by or help them by us saying you know you're wrong or know whatever what's whatever's going to make them feel safe enough and protected enough or whatever the boundaries are going to be are the greatest chance of influencing someone to look at their own selves you know it's like they say um example is the best teacher it's still true it's always been true and it will be true i think forever because You know, that's what people, like with 12-step, that's why they say in 12-step programs, you know, you attract people through your own healing, your own happiness, your own um, ability to uh, process and be, make mature decisions. You don't try to talk anybody into coming. You don't try to, you know, tell them what to do. They, they will be attracted by your health and healing 
and your sense of peace. So that's kind of how I look at social media. If I really want to help other people or change other people's minds, you know, I've got to not react to things and give myself time to, if I feel like a response is even necessary, to, you know, be able to respond in a way that's going to be attractive to them and not make them, you know, armor up more. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what everybody's, you know, uh, or a lot of people are having so much difficulty because they're so armored up, and that just is, you know, being in a fight response. Mm-hmm. So for those of us that, you know, are listening to you, or perhaps we've always known that maybe we're a person uh, who, um, in my case, being a workaholic, and realizing I'm a workaholic for a reason. And I love that you you talked about the fact that first recognizing, you know, the pattern and then taking that coping mechanism and turning it into something where you can thrive rather than always be in whatever it is that we're experiencing. Um, what are some of the first steps that you you recommend to people? Because it is a process. It's been a real process for me and I know for others to go from whatever uh, the coping strategy has been to turn it into a skill? What are the first steps, Terry? Well, I think the awareness, you know, we have to learn. It's like we talk about in therapy, you know, first we do it in our head, then our heart, then our soul. We have to get the information. We have to understand what's happening. Um, And that's what therapy really is about is just, being able to teach ourselves and learn um, what is healthy and what is not, because what is normal in our society is often not healthy. And what we grew up with a lot of times is, you know, we think is normal. It's not necessarily healthy, though. So I think we do have to do a lot of head work to get the information, to know the language, Um, But then we have to do the feeling work. We have to get into our heart. And that is where it's the hardest to feel safe is going into those feelings. And so, you know, most people, it's not really recommended to try to do by yourself. You need other friends or women or therapists or group, you know, to be able to feel our feelings fully without any shame and breathe through them and process them through talking, writing, um, whatever works for you, creative, you know, whatever is creative or spiritual is usually going to be the greatest help to work through your feelings. Um, And then the soul work, of course, is kind of, I, I look at it as like the integration of everything to where it becomes a way of life where, you know, you can start to recognize, like I say, pretty early on, okay, you know, I'm falling back into this old strategy that is not going to be healthy for me. And do I, you know, when I recognize that the whole decade of my 60s was so many things right after another, I knew I had to get a counselor. I knew I couldn't do this myself. I can't You can't always be objective enough, you know, Mm -hmm. and I had to do the work, you know, I was like, yeah, you have to actually do the writing and, you know, everything, because I had, I had done it in my head and probably, you know, I know I had done some hard work because it's grief work, like mostly, but it wasn't integrated to where I felt a piece about it all, like I really was feeling like I maybe not totally everything was resolved but that I had a piece about whatever came up I could feel and I could just let it you know have its moment and watch it kind of melt away and accept it and that's soul work I mean acceptance to me is big soul work Mm -hmm. Uh (laughs) you know because we don't you know, 
when losses and change is that painful, it takes a long time to accept. Sure it's does. Very, it's grief work. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I hope that helps. <laughs> <clears throat> it's such a great topic because we can look at life or experience life through <clears throat> the eyes of our six-year-old who was traumatized or the 12-year-old or the 30-year-old divorcee or what have you, and not even realize we're doing it. Definitely, definitely. That's why this is lifelong work, you know, and, and it's not really work. I mean, eventually the rewards outweigh the, and the benefits outweigh the, you know, the difficulty of struggle. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, it does feel like mostly work and struggle, but I think, you know, each year, it starts to feel more like there's just such great reward to this that you carry a piece with you. People can't push your buttons like they used to. Exactly. You know? um, Del- <laughs> Del Marie is sharing. Um, I think a prior traumatic experience helps the depth of reaction. My son asked how I can be calm with being violated once again because I didn't respond like he thought I should respond. I told him, at my age, I have been through a lot of obstacles that I can handle anything except for a sudden death of a loved one. I'm prepared for anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens when you are introspective and you keep doing your work and you're, you know, keep on the spiritual path because the spiritual path, I think, helps us to stay connected to our true self and it helps us keep going inward and keep continuing the healing and then you can you know um, cope with it I mean that's the greatest skill right the greatest coping skill is now I can accept pretty much whatever life throws at me without becoming self-destructive or destructive to someone else, mm-hmm. you know, without hurting myself, whatever it is, even if it's mild hurting ourselves just by, you know, shutting down and not feeling, you know, that's hurting ourselves. Um, that's causing pain to stay in our body and it will make us physically sick if we don't process it. So, you know, that is the great um, gift of, of recovery and healing is, you know, we do um, manage uh, what life throws at us in ways that are much more healthy and healing. And life is hard. It's going to do it no matter what. You know, we're all going to lose people we love as we get older. If we're fortunate, it's not till we're old. And we're going to struggle with different addictions sometimes our whole lives. I mean, we it's very easy to... For me to fall back into, you know, too much TV watching or, you know, any kind of avoidance behavior. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, there, that's always going to be a challenge, you know. But it, it it's not like, I say, like um, so much work as you get older. It's like there's just a piece about, okay, you know, and I'm going to do this, but I know it's going to be helpful and you even start to feel better faster. So that helps a lot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And if people want to talk more about this or any subject in particular, if, if there's some things that people really want to um, talk about or, or me put out there, um, I will try to do this whenever I can. Um, I'm, you know, I just would like to know what it is maybe people are wanting. Um, and if there's, you know, questions that I can answer and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And not just be my, what I think is, you know, what people need, <laughs> but what you will right. you so, need and want. Thank you for that, Terry. Um, all of you that are out there listening, those of, us here on this side of the pond, the western side of the pond on Turtle Island, um, and on the other side of the pond, wherever you may happen to be. I know that you have many fans all around the globe, and you are offering an an invitation that if there is a topic that anyone would like to have you address, that you're willing to take a look at that and 
and walk us through it. I think that's wonderful. Thank you for that, Terry. Um, um, and thank you all. And I really am um, praying for us all to have a very blessed year and that we all have more peace in our year. <laughs> exactly. And with that, last comment of the day from uh, listeners in the chat room comes from Rob Coulter, who says, you have to be able to look another man who is suffering in the eye and say, go and be well. I will not help you. He did the same to you, and reciprocation is all they understand. Mm -hmm. So yes. maybe that's a topic for... <laughs> yes, for we a... could do a whole show on that topic for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Terry, for spending time with us this morning. Thank you all. Thank you.